I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I mean, you've already kind of told me a bunch of stuff. I just have a nice little screensaver. This is just some of the work that I've done, um, mostly Hollywood stuff, a lot of the industrial design stuff. If it doesn't come to fruition, we can't ever show it. So we've got piles of work that I'd love to share with people that we can't show anybody. Um, so basically, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I started off at Caltech studying robotics and fluid dynamics, thought I was going to become a researcher and a scientist and be a smart person. And uh, the writing was on the wall pretty soon that that wasn't really the right plan for me. Um, so I ended up going to a school called the Art Center College of Design, which is very an unconventional place, very akin to Juilliard, but uh, commercial arts instead of the performing. So studying industrial design, went on to uh, get a job offer after my first year at BMW. Uh, at the time, they owned Rolls-Royce and Rover, so we got to do quite a, quite a bit of fun projects. Uh, ended up returning to school to finish off. Uh, upon graduation, started designing as chief designer for Oakley Sunglasses. Um, at the time, I was doing some, some work on the side for the US Navy, um, just because that's what you do. Um, but from that, I got uh, an interesting phone call um, to work as kind of a collaboration in a think tank environment for a movie called The Minority Report. Um, at the time, we didn't know it was a movie. It was very hush-hush. But we spent six months looking at the next 80 years of everything. So what would advertising look like? What would social media look like? So this is in 1999, 98. Um, so it was before Facebook didn't exist. It was still four years away from even an inkling that it existed. Um, so it's interesting to see, like these are some of the drawings from it. Um, kind of now after, you know, 14 years where that kind of stuff is starting to actually come to fruition. Um, but I did want to talk to you today specifically about innovation, and a lot of people are talking about this, it's kind of our title, but specifically about disruptive innovation and what that actually means. So I'm just going to go through this fairly quick. So one of my titles, among many others, like most of you, you don't get summed up by one particular title, but one of them is a futurist, and most people kind of ask that question. Um, a lot of what it has to do with is we take a very kind of scientific approach to looking at both megatrends, microtrends, cultural influences, what's going on from news to budgets, everything else, to actually try and make as accurate of a prediction of what's going to happen in the future and what's coming down the pipeline um, as possible. So we mix that then with uh, upcoming trends. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about specifically what disruptive innovation is, because it's actually something very specific. And if you didn't read that fast enough, it's too bad. Um, but it really comes down to some of the, the terminology where it's basically a theory of prediction. It's basically a process to actually throw yourself against a competitor. So if you're being innovative in a particular space, what is the dynamics of that space that you're going into, whatever it might be, whether it's mobile technology and apps, or whether it's gaming, or whether it's engineering around trains, could be anything. But who are the players in that space? Who are your competitors? And what, on what cycle of the innovation spectrum there are, there, are they on? And how does that relate to how you can get into that space and how you can actually have success or whether you're just going to get stomped? Um, so, <clears throat> just so I kind of like this. This goes back a long time ago. I, I'll dilute into a weird story. So I was 16 years old. I like to draw and paint. My dad says, OK, well, let me send you over to a friend of mine that, to see if you actually have any talent at this. So I'm 16 years old. I walk into Amblin Studios, not knowing what Amblin Studios really was. Um, it's actually Steven Spielberg's studio. Um, walked in, and they were just working on a movie called Jurassic Park. And kind of walked in there, and there's a giant T-Rex head, and my jaw dropped, and I'm just like, ah, ah, you know, this is artwork and design. And I just was kind of blown away by this stuff. But there was this, a particular scene in that film that kind of resonated with me. And, um, I don't know if you remember this, but they talk about the raptors and the innovation and getting in that space and, um, and how it relates. But they talked about it's not the one that you're looking at. It's not, the space, it's not the raptor that you're making eye contact with that you have to worry about. It's the two from the sides that you didn't see coming. They're the ones that are going to take you out. And it's particularly relevant for innovation, especially disruptive innovation, because by its very nature, disruptive innovation means something that came out of left field. It's something that you didn't expect that came from another thing. So one of the examples I use is nobody really would have predicted that Apple would take over the music business. A small computer company that struggled, it wasn't really Microsoft. They were expensive. You couldn't get in. You couldn't break in hardware. They didn't have they had limited software. I don't think too many people would have seen that they would have taken over the music business. So that's one of those disruptors that we're going to talk about. 
So this goes into design thinking. A lot of people think because I'm, I'm a designer that I think every solution, every problem is designed. It's not, but it's a process of analytically thinking about a problem, pulling yourself outside of that fold. And one of the things that actually I, I really enjoy working with the research at the university is because the level of depth that our researchers have in a specific topic is, is quite amazing, but um, they don't always have the same kind of breadth across a lot of different connectors. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to do, and, and a lot of other people are helping me, um, is bridge those gaps and get those, those people with those dynamic lengths of information to actually start working together to come up with new innovation. But there's a process of design that typically is Strategically, we figure out what we're going to do. There's a plan that's put in place. There's kind of strategic thinking. All the kind of big executives think about, okay, this is how we're going to do this. And at the time when you finally get the creative people involved in the innovation space, you've limited them to being a tactical execution. You've already decided what it is that you want to have happen. You're just bringing those creative people in at the last minute to actually execute that creativity. And it's a strategic failure. The, if you can use design in a strategic standpoint, it's actually something that's been done forever. And when the example I use is Thomas Edison. Most people would equate his greatest invention as the light bulb, the most iconic thing that he ever did. The truth is the light bulb in one form or another existed for two, 300 years prior to that. They just couldn't sustain it. So it really was much more of a parlor trick and the last piece of a puzzle. So his ability to see design as a strategic element to understand how do I distribute power? How are the cables going to work? How is the system of maintenance and repair? He saw the whole kind of strategy behind how light in an environment could change the world. You know, at, the, at the time, you think of the oil industry as being such a big thing. The primary focus of the oil industry at this time was whale oil for lamps. And that's the industry that he really disrupted was the oil industry. They had to actually find something else. Um, so another innovator... Our disruptive innovator was uh, this guy, um, good old Henry Ford. So you guys are familiar with the Model T? It's pretty iconic. It's kind of a standard stamp. Do you guys know that he actually started out racing cars for Cadillac? And that was his actual beginning? At the time when cars came on, they were incredibly expensive. It was the same kind of thing with a lot of innovation. They come in at the top tier, very, very small to produce, extremely expensive to get involved in. Um, but his real innovation, besides kind of taking what England had done with the assembly line and taking it into the next generation, was actually seeing that to be disruptive meant to get into the smaller end of the market and expand that place and make everyone have the transportation. So part of being disruptive is, is how far your breath actually goes and how wide you can go. Uh, and this goes to a little bit of kind of my hinting at before. I'll keep coming back to some of the subjects. But one of these things is that being able to see that scale of innovation and where you sit on the food chain with what you're trying to achieve. If you try and do something better than the big guys, you're almost 100% gonna fail. They will stomp you down every time. The trick of the thing is to actually come into the bottom of the market. I'm gonna show you a bunch of examples in this. Come into the bottom of the market. It doesn't mean it's not clever. It just means that that's the space where their profitability is at a minimum. You're going to push them up because you're pushing them into being smart. They, the higher up into the food chain of their market they go, the more profits in it. So you're actually taking over the cheap end of the business as you move them up. So one of the examples is Kodak and Polaroid. Now Kodak was one of the most innovative companies that's ever been, but they never felt that Polaroid was a real threat. They were cheap, instant Polaroid cameras. This is obviously pre-digital. They didn't care. They looked at that and go, well, that's fine, but that's a lot of headache for the amount of money we make on the low, low end of the spectrum. We don't really do this. Go ahead. And our, our customers want perfect, the best quality we can have. And that's where our profits are. So they moved up into their kind of food chain, and Polaroid was able to come in and do other stuff. Then a little thing called digital came along. All of a sudden, Polaroids weren't really relative. And what we find, in, and you can see this now too, if you look at the gaming engines your children or, or yourselves play with, you watched Xbox and PlayStation kind of do this battle over the last 10 years. Better graphics, more power, better, shinier, faster, more abilities, all this kind of stuff. And then this little thing came in, which is really the only disruptive innovation Japan's done in 10 years, which is called the Nintendo Wii. And all of a sudden, it wasn't about the best graphics or the most, ex you know, most detailed things or how much power or speed it had. They remembered a fundamental principle of their industry. It's about having fun and playing. And that's not critical to have the best graphics. 
That was just a technological evolution that they got sucked into. So it's something to be aware of that there's opportunities even in spaces that have a lot of innovation. Well, I'll go back to the example of this pretty quick. So Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler are often referred to as the big three in the United States. Um, you know, obviously General Motors, Holden, and how they're acting here now. Pretty much it's easy. I can tell you a story. I'm, I'm the fastest runner in the world, as long as I race myself. Um, and it's a little bit of a way of thinking when I talk about the American auto industry. They did really good after World War II, but they pretty much bombed the other countries that made cars. So um, there wasn't any competitors. So they had the entire space to themselves. So of course they were king of the hill. Then along comes Toyota. Now what does Toyota come into? Do they come in with a Cadillac? Are they doing Lexus to start with? Of course not. What they're doing is a little three-wheeled vehicle that was in the process of rebuilding Japan. Cheap, affordable to its own population, had domestic funding, which is critical to being a disruptive innovator. You have to have a sense of disruptive innovation coming domestically for a domestic market with the views to the outside. So Toyota comes in and slowly moves up, but what do they do? They follow the same suit. So as they start dominating and pushing out a lot of the big three and taking a lot of their market shares, they've moved up Camry, Corolla, better and better, and into Lexus, and into some of the more premium brands. What happens next? The Koreans jump in the market. What do they do? Almost the same thing verbatim. Three-wheeled, little, simple cars. All of a sudden, they enter into the market. They get a foothold. They're not a threat. They're taking away stuff that's not profitable. They're not going directly head-to-head -head with somebody that you can't compete with. So it's about being clever about how you disrupt. That's actually whether you're going to continue in the space or whether you're going to really struggle. Now we're seeing the Koreans have taken a huge market share. They're dominating the industry. They're doing a great job. Now we start seeing Cherry, Great Wall start coming in. The Chinese are coming in. And what's interesting is we're actually seeing Ford and GM regroup in a lot of ways and looking at the future of their businesses expanding into Asia and China. And for General Motors, they're putting billions of dollars into South Korea as a hub because there's so much auto industry that already exists there. So you see a cycle starting to happen. And this is something you can start applying to anything. You can kind of look at any industry that you're particularly interested in and see where's the cutting edge, where are they actually sitting on this food chain. So one of these things you talk about, well, we're small and we're nimble and they're large and they're slow and they can't react. But it, it really is only relative as long as there is the other. One of the things that happens as you push that person out, you actually become them. Um, and so you kind of have this thing we talk about, bigger, bigger, bankrupt. So how far can you push it and what makes smart sense but at some point, you're going to have to turn around and go, how many assets, what do we actually have, and who, do, who are we competing with? Uh, and there's lots of examples we can give. But So what does an innovation economy actually look like? So I can use the US just because I'm more familiar with it. But after World War II, you had a huge industry that had been turned on that was built around a war mechanism that had been turned now inwards. Um, and what's interesting is they had this cycle I'm, I'm continuing to talk about where you have disruption, then you have sustainability innovation. And that's what a lot of people think about, is like making my product better. It's the new Apple iPhone, the new one, the new one, the new one. That's a sustainable in innovation format. The problem with that is that no one buys a four, an iPhone 4 once the 5 is out. Right? So you're just replacing. I'll talk more about that. But it's interesting when you start looking at the economics reaction is that you have nine recessions in the United States. None of them last more than six months. So they drop down, they pull back up because they're in a full loop. They're reinvesting from an efficiency innovation model back into disruption, and they had continued to do that. All right? Now you get into 1991, 92. All of a sudden, the recession hits, and it takes 15 months to start recovering. Then you go forward to 2001, it takes 39 months, over three years to start recovering. Now we're in 60 something months, 67 plus months, still not fully recovered to come back to the peak of where we were. So what's happening that's different? What's happening is something I'll continue to talk about, but we go from disruption innovation to sustainable information to efficiency innovation. And the beauty of efficiency innovation is that it produces a lot of cash with low assets. Right? So you, you don't have a lot of headaches. They're off your books, but you're starting to cycle a lot of cash. And the problem is, if you reinvest that money, you can double it again, double it again, double it again, but you're not actually doing anything except for changing the decimal point. Because you're not taking that risk that's cash-intensive to go back into disruptive innovation, you're actually setting yourself up 
to have a pile of cash with nothing else and no future. So <clears throat> this talks about kind of breaking these out. So the impact of being disruptive, the benefits to the general community, and this is why it's so critical and why we're changing what we are doing, is it is the critical mover that creates jobs and makes products affordable and accessible to people, but it also requires a lot of capital. So it's that kind of R&D phase of projects, so, which is actually good. The banks want to lend the money because that's how they make more money. Um, the next kind of phase I talked about is sustainable innovation. Now, it's the bigger, better phase. We're improving our products and services. We're kind of streamlining the best way we can. There's very few new jobs done at this point. You have existing companies. They have their quotas. They have their 40 personnel or 4,000 personnel, whatever the, their size is. And they're pretty much humming along, doing pretty well. They're making profits, but they're not expanding at any kind of growth rate. It also doesn't need large uses of capital. It's self-sufficient. It's kind of in that sustainable mode. So does that actually grow your local economy? Not really. It's nice to have, but it doesn't really grow anything. So the next phase past that is the efficiency model. So this is kind of the Walmart. Cheaper, 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 cheaper. It's a little bit of a race to the bottom. So yes, your company's more profitable. You've got less expenditures. You've got less overhead. You've got less in your asset books. But the problem is, although you're very cash rich, you don't have any innovations that are coming. You're not, you have no growth, and you're not using capital at all because you're basically you are full of capital. The problem with capital is it effectively means nothing. It's attached to nothing, no sense of value other than what somebody actually says, this penny's worth this today and tomorrow it'll be worth that. But it has no intrinsic value other than the system that we use. So, and this is an interesting aspect because one of the, you know, you think most of the time bankers and venture capitalists and that whole capital world is usually very isolated in our, in our perceptions. So this is the first one's actually a quote that I had for a thing I did in 2004. We met with Intel Investment. We were so excited. We're like, OK, it's one of the largest investment firms in the world. This is going to be great. We're going to make tons of money. Isn't this going to be fantastic? Loved our idea. Sorry, you only need $5 million. We can't be bothered with that. We really like to invest in, you know, because we can't manage a portfolio that's too big. So you know, if you've got something you need $100 million or $20 million for, let us know. <laughs> OK. You know, that was kind of my reaction. Sure, I'll take 20, uh, buy a house, I don't know, you know, do whatever. I just don't need that to really be disruptive unless I'm doing something so expensive. That's usually second, third round funding. You don't need those kind of scalability. So, but they're not being foolish. They're being smart. They're saying, look, we've got a certain amount of resources and personnel. How many jobs can we really manage? The guy that needs $50 for an invention is just as much work as the person who needs $5 million as far as actually doing the paperwork, actually managing them, making sure there's success. So which ones are worth our while? And once you get into that mode, you're in the efficiency model yourself. You're no longer disruptive. You're no longer even sustainable. You are purely in the efficiency model. And this is something to be consciously aware of because all of a sudden companies like Intel and these big VC firms that had this sense of control over this space that were really the only place to go was an angel or somebody. Um, you have these little things disrupting the environment, like Indiegogo, Kickstarter, these crowdsource funding. Laws are changing worldwide. Last year in the United States, you used to have to be a qualified investor. And I don't know if you guys have gone through this process of raising capital where you have to find investors that are qualified. You have $3 million worth of disposable income. And you can, you can prove that before I can even let you invest in a product that I have. So it was, it was an old thing from the Depression era back in the 30s to protect people from being scammed. But it's completely outdated and completely outmoded. There's an interesting statistic, and I don't have it with me, so please verify it on your own. But the National Endowments for the Arts in the United States is one of the largest endowments for providing support for arts of all kinds. Kickstarter funded 17 times more projects and more funding to that industry than the National Endowments for Art in the United States. So a little startup comes in and is just annihilating the big players. And it's just starting. So what's wrong with this space? And I'll kind of go through this fairly quick. Um, you know, we talked about disruptive innovation being kind of our first, sustainable being our, our next kind of evolution. We've been disrupted. We've got a foothold. We've done something interesting. Now we've got to improve, right? We ship and fix. We fix, we fix, we get better. We're back into the efficiency model. Take that capital, reinvest in being disruptive. It's very difficult. You look at the auto industry. Everyone thought we're going to jump into electric cars, especially when the GFC hit. Where are we going to reinvest? Well, somebody like Ford says the problem is we're Ford Motor Company. 
we have these systems, we have these Goliaths that we own that are real assets. How do we actually just drop all that? We can't drop all that. So instead of investing in battery technology, they took a different look. So they put $600 million into looking at using lasers instead of spark plugs. So your engine in, in the next couple of years will actually have lasers that actually fire the gas. Now what's interesting about that is that actually allows a more efficient burn. You get more power for less fuel use, and what comes out of the tailpipe is 98% cleaner than what it did with a spark plug. So it's those, those changes are fostering innovation that if they reinvest, you start seeing now they're going to be innovative. So you still got the same infrastructure set up. The problem, again, as I said, is this kind of model down at the bottom. If it becomes linear, the problem with linear thinking is that linear has a start and it has an end. The starts are fine, but the ends are a problem. So if you get stuck in that efficiency model, your, your business is ripe to be attacked. So how can we change this? And a lot of this is creating a, a culture, and it's the stuff that we're trying to do is, what is that culture? How do we actually support entrepreneurship and invention and, and innovation? And a lot of it has to do with cross-collaboration and being able to work together and see those opportunities and see how something that's unexpected. If you think about the things that you would consider innovative, make a list of the top 10 things that you think are innovative, and then see where are, where are the collaborations that needed to happen to take to take place. So Thomas Edison thought the recording device might be nice for business people to take notes. I think the music industry might disagree. <clears throat> so again, it's just repeating myself, just you know, stop chasing the money and start making meaning. Um, and this goes to kind of my next point. So there's something at Apple that we talk about a lot. And <clears throat> the customer, in our opinion, doesn't know what they want. We don't ask the customer what they want. We don't care what the customer wants. What we need to know is what is the job that they need done and how do we actually achieve that job? So what is that that they need? Let's fill that need and then they'll follow. I think I'm getting the wrap up. It's getting close. I think I'm almost done. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with this. So um, something to think about is a lot of industries work in a trial and error. If you think about, you know, my dad worked in aerospace in the kind of 60s, so I always thought it was kind of a good example that, yeah, we'll, we'll stick these wings on this bit, and we'll put this plane like this, and we'll put somebody in who's, who's, who's pretty brave, and we'll send him out, and we'll see if it flies, and if it doesn't, we'll, we'll get another guy and not tell him about the last guy, and we'll stick some different wings on and see how it went. And, um, the medical industry, to a large degree, is, is, has a lot of similarities in terms of your doctor has this wealth of knowledge, but he's using a lot of innovation, and it's a human-to-human -human kind of connection. So some of the stuff that's happening is this empirical medicine is starting to actually really take a, a fold, which is using big data to start showing patterns. Where are the similarities finding? Now that we can actually look at enough sample rates, we're starting to have a situation where we can go human to machine as far as our information. Where this starts getting interesting is in some of the devices that we see now coming on board with wearables is they're starting to have machine talk to machine. So machine, you might be wearing a wristwatch or a little lapel that's actually starting to take some of your biometrics and some of your data and talk to other machines to basically give you insight into what your body is doing that you might not be aware of. That could be everything from a glucose monitor to a, for a diabetes to it goes on and on and on. Where it's really starting to get interesting is starting to pull these systems together and cross-reference them is allowing machines to now talk to humans. And this is kind of the cusp that we're on now is where actually our technology is getting to a point where it's allowed to actually talk back to us and help us develop where we want to go. And those there's some real interesting innovations that are around the corner. I already talked about that, so we'll skip that. Um, this is the last thing I'll leave you with. So <clears throat> there's a process of analog versus digital. And some of you may have heard this before. Um, we, as human beings, are analog. We, we're not digital. The problem is our technology is digital because it has shortcomings. It doesn't really do what we wish it would do. I remember when I bought my first computer, I thought it was going to be closer to what Star Trek was saying and turned out to be basically a big calculator. Um, so it was a little disappointing. And one of the ways you can actually look at this is if, you, if, you have a, if you're sitting with a friend and having coffee or something, if they, if they look at their watch, if they're still wearing a watch, um, as soon as they put it down, ask them what time it is. And almost 100% of the time, if it's an analog watch, they will have to look at the watch again. Because they're not actually looking to see what time it is. What they're actually looking at, our brains are kind of 
beautifully efficient and also lazy at the same time. What they're looking at is the negative space until the next thing that they have to do. Because we're event-based creatures. We do things from event to event to event. And that's our point of change. So they're saying, I've got this much. Once it gets this much, I have to do something, so I'll just turn that off. So they're not actually looking to see what time it is. Now, somebody with a digital watch will tell you exactly to the letter what time it is. The problem is it takes five minutes for their brain to calculate that same abstraction to turn it into analog and to have that same spatial understanding. So it's one of those things where the more analog you can make your innovation, the more you're going to get people to easily pick it up. Think iPad versus writing code. You know, I hand my grandma an iPad in five minutes, she's doing it better than I am. So it's very intuitive. But I'll leave you guys with that. I know I'm running out of time. Thank you. Yeah.